Anybody have any questions? And things you've wondered about? Turn the projector off. Yeah, go ahead and turn the projector off. So the story he told is impossible. Um, he said that he wanted to name the company General, but that was taken. Uh, General Electric and other and other such things. And that he was in a cab in Berlin and a car cut him off and stopped, the cab had to stop short and it was an Opel Commodore. And that car didn't come out until after he had made that decision. So I have no idea where the name came from and apparently he didn't remember. <laughs> I, I also heard this story, he wanted general and it was taken and so was Admiral, so he went to Commodore. But, but this was during ty type, uh, calculators? Or type no, writers? typewriters. <laughs> typewriters, yeah. right. So this would have been 1958. Right. By the way, the way Leonard and I met was at the Commodore 64 anniversary, um, which had a rare appearance by Jack Trickmail, and, and we ran into each other. And he did, he told all the stories. I, I had been a teletype repairman, and he had been a typewriter repairman, yeah. and both in the service, and I had you know, so. Um, well, here, I've, I've got a question for you. Yes, sir. So when we get to the CES show of 85, right. we arrive. Uh, one of the things we noticed is we didn't have any hotel room reservations. <laughs> so I, um, I, I do what you do. You, I grabbed the, the uh, Saul Davidson was the CEO, the t president at the time. I grabbed his secretary who's got, you know, put a credit card in her hand. I walked the credit card still in her hand up to the counter and, uh, you know, get a room for three of the nights. But did you get your hotel room canceled? Um, we left. Yeah. So you you were at the you were at the Stardust, right? Um, at the uh, eighty five CES. Yeah. Um, because I'm standing next to the guy who canceled your reservations. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when, <laughs> was, so uh, contrary to the common stories, um, Dad quit at CES. It wasn't at. You know, it wasn't at the board meeting or the, mm -hmm. the board meeting a month later. Right. Um, so he quit and we left. So I'm talking about the one where you were with the TARP. Oh, the, oh yeah. The, the one in, in summer of 85. No. Um, the, or the, because the January. I, the first time I talked with, with Jack right. Jamal, was at the uh, uh, the first CES where he was there with the TARP. Okay. And we were there, and I was there with 128. That was with, that was the one 80. with the big billboard. Welcome to Atari Country. Um, it's the one I have a picture. It's the one that has a big picture of a Commodore ship. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we, we had ours that looked like a ship. But but that year we got there, and our hotel rooms were canceled. And we were told they were done by Atari. And I hope it was because I stood next to I saw Yash Terkler standing next to Pat McAllister. Right. They were canceling your hotel rooms at the Stardust. Stardust, that, please. That, that would have that would have been unkind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ours had been canceled by, by you guys. Was what we we Se seems unlikely. I'm pretty sure we were staying in the sand. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. but it, it still existed. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> But, and, and other no one would any. No one would ever do anything nasty like that. No. <laughs> well, that wasn't you guys in the white car driving around the door. Black cars. No. <laughs> so, I have a question about the CS. I don't know if you told me about the uh, who played it. Did you say Tom Check? So, yeah. Tom Believe Tom nothing, Tom. Michael Tom Check. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, except his name. Okay. Uh, Possibly was, uh, the spelling. Was there like a culture of a Voipo demo in a bit systems as well for the CES? I, was there ever like a demo with a bouncing ball or something like that before the event? Because I have are you talking about the Amiga? I don't, I don't no, remember. No, not Amiga, not I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I do not remember what uh, for the for the Commodore 64. I don't. Any bit systems where it would be cool to show up for or something? I, 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 I do not remember. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tom Check tells lots of interesting stories. He, um, he did the VIX-20. So, uh, I'm trying to remember what year it was. It was probably about five years ago. A film crew came out to visit Dad to interview him for a uh, documentary, which is supposed to come out later this year. Um, and at one point, the interviewer asks him about this 
quote, famous meeting in London where the VIC-20 was designed. And Dad turns to me and goes, <laughs> um, because that was the meeting where Mike Tomczyk claims to have specified what the machine should do and got input from all of the people and laid out everything in the system. Um, and the meeting never occurred. The machine was designed six months earlier, and after it was done was the first time Tom Check saw one. Um, and I know this because I was at the meeting where we showed it to the marketing people, and Mike was sitting next to me, and he kept going, how does that work? What What's that for? It was really, it, it what is the marketing guy? And reading this, the story, I just, just cracked up. But people's memories are fallible, um, and some are more fallible than others. <laughs> <laughs> Very different. Well put. The, um, yeah. What's a memorable story of your father in the Otomiverse? Like, well, what's one of your more memorable things? Maybe something you haven't heard before. So, um, when I was in college, uh, I would work, well, college and high school, um, I would work for Commodore in the, on the, in the summer. So, my first year, I just assumed, my first year of college, I just assumed that I would work for Commodore in this, during the summer. Um, so, I just, you know, first day after school ended, um, you know, I was ready to go to work dead. And he's like, what are, what, why are you getting in the car? Well, I assume I'm going to be working for you over the summer. Why? <laughs> because I always did. Well, so. All right, fine. Come with me. Um, and went, we went to the office and um, went to the people that were designing the calculators at the time um, and said to the, the guy in charge of the calculator thing, this is my son, Leonard have him do something useful. Um, and that was all, the, that was the instructions I got for the summer. Um, and I designed calculations and did all sorts of wonderful things. It was, it was really cool. The next year, I thought, okay, he doesn't want me to work for him during the summer. So I went and got a summer job at um, the Ames Research Center, um, doing really exciting stuff. I was counting craters on Mars. Awesome. Really, really great. Um, and when I didn't get in the car that first day, I said, so where are you going? I'm going to, I got a job at, at the Ames Research Center. What did you do that for? <laughs> so I, I worked for him for summers after that. And we didn't have to discuss it in advance. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I've heard a lot of versions, and as you said, people's memories are fallible. Of why Atari did not sell the NES, and I'm curious: were you involved in that? Do you know what version was there ever a chance of it? I do not believe there was ever a chance of it. I was not involved at all. Okay. Um, for the first six months and almost year and a half of. Um, Atari, okay. uh, we were really, really, really busy oh. working on the SK, oh. uh, and anything else we ignored. Okay. Uh, uh, going from design concept to working prototype in cases at CES in six months That's fine. took some effort. <laughs> um, and paying attention to little things like Nintendo plus, uh, was not anything we. <laughs> plus, some, when the, some of the engineers got there, they had just left Commodore. They arrived to have their uh, their trailers uh, padlocked by the FBI. Um, that Doug Ren, yeah, uh, they, uh, who, who made the Wall Street Journal front page, good for Doug. <laughs> yeah, um, there was a. Uh, monstrous missing match it was. Uh, between Commodore and Amiga and Atari and all sorts of stuff with lawsuits going back and forth and it was, it was uh, they admitted they had stuck stuff in the uh, taking the whole design of the Z80 and stuffed it in the uh, shredder before leaving and then took the mag tapes with them they admitted that part so 
so that that's what was started on. Yeah, it, was, it was it was bizarre. Um, now, so the last you got. I'm sorry. Yes. Now, do you remember when the first time you really think really about Nikola Tesla? Wow. <laughs> Uh, about Tesla. Nikola Tesla. Uh, uh, no, I certainly was familiar with him because of the Tesla call. But, but no. Do you think your father once kind of got into thinking about Nikola Tesla? My guess is he would not would not have recognized the name. Okay, but then. Back then, the master of the work wasn't so recognized, right? And my father was a profoundly uninterested in technology person. <laughs> this, this will come as a shock to some of you. A, uh, no, it ran a, a computer company better than... Yeah, um, so the, yep. the first computer system that my father was comfortable using was an Apple iPad. Um, and just because it was intuitive and he could do things, but completely illiterate on computers. On the, unlike you, you are... I'm a nerd. I am very, very much a nerd. <laughs> yeah. were, you, were you involved very much with CES uh, in the late 80s, mid 80s to early 90s? Um, with Atari. With Atari. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was in this town um, many times, um, and like Bill, uh, except at the software end instead of the hardware end, you would get a piece of, of uh, hardware to demo, and you had to write a demo, um, and you didn't get the hardware till the night before the show opened. Um, <laughs> like, like meeting John Figgins five yeah, months before. Um, the, I think the worst one of those for me was when that happened in Hanover. So I got the, the prototype of the hardware um, at three in the morning, Hanover time, and I had just flown over, and I had to write code for hardware that didn't work the way it was specified. Um, prior to a show, bad things happen. Do you have a question? Yeah, so what was your favorite while working at Hanover? After the release of 64, what was your favorite uh, Commodore 64 game? Favorite Commodore 64 game? Did you have one? Um. What did you find yourself playing most of? Oh, I'm trying to remember the name. Damn it. Um. Yeah. Probably in this box. The more popular. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in that box. Um. <laughs> A, uh, a maze that you jump through. Jump in? Probably. Sounds right. Yeah. Um, and the most amazing piece of software that I remember well for the Commodore 64 was, of course, anything written by Jeff Pinter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just awesome stuff. So I have a question. Yeah. So you said that you guys, your dad left at CES of, it would have been 84 then. Yeah. So that picture I have of him showing the, the two computers. Yeah, it was at that show. Right, but then, yeah. I mean, so that really is the cusp of him leaving, and like he, a couple days later, he's gone. Yeah. Well, um, so that, that was a very strange show. And, and they, Yes, and they didn't tell us right away, you know, so we, we, we felt a bump and then only started figuring out as they tried out different rumors on us to see which ones would you know, pass muster. And stuff. Yeah, so, so <laughs> three things happened at the same time, and I guess you guys are the first people to, to hear this, because um, everyone involved is now dead, so it's okay. Um, so Commodore passed a billion dollars in sales um, that preceding 12 months. Right. It was the 25th anniversary of Commodore as a company, so 1984 started in 59. Um, and so there was a big party and something that sounds completely unrelated, um, a new version of the Corvette came out that year. 
and my dad loved it. Thought it was just awesome. So my two brothers and I um, bought him one. And uh, my younger brother took him around to um, Chevy Sherrods to figure out exactly what the interior and style, everything else he wanted. And then bought that car and Sam and Gary drove it up to Vegas. And at a low point um, in CES, Gary had to figure some reason to take Dad out the front entrance to the hotel. And Dad goes, that's the car. That's exactly what I wanted. And he walks over to it and he walks around, it's the right interior, it's the right color, and this is this perfect, and, and, and Gary reaches into his pocket and hands him the keys. <laughs> Which is awesome. And then the next day, um, he had a meeting with Irving Gould, um, and Irving was using um, company assets like they were owned, his own. Like the jet? Like the jet. And Dad didn't like that, and said that was wrong, and said, you can't do that while I'm president. And Irving said, goodbye. So he left, um, went back to his room, got my mom, they packed and hopped in the car and drove up. So it was convenient that the home, that the car was there. <laughs> Otherwise, we didn't have plenty of here. You guys just heard it for the first time publicly. <laughs> he's, he's told some CBM family before. But yeah. This is, this is wow. the But uh, yeah, everyone involved is is no longer with us. So. They, uh, and, and then they tried rumors on us, like saying, well, we just hit a billion, but we felt he couldn't take us to 10 billion. And we went, what? No, you can, you can grow it to this. You know, so they would try different things. One, one was that they wouldn't promote you to, like, be a vice president. That was one of the rumors they tried on us. Yeah, well, given that I didn't actually work for right. Commodore at the time, right. that was <laughs> sort of <laughs> uh, management, you know. Yeah, um, yeah the, the rumor, the, the story I heard many times was that um, Dad wanted his sons to run the company, right. and we were obviously incompetent, uh, so we couldn't do that, so they had to get rid of him. But and meanwhile, Sam was running Commodore Tokyo. Several, several years at that time. Yeah, he was running Commodore Japan and, and in fact continued to do it for a couple of months after Dad left. Yes, that's part of my story, so actually. Is. So, yeah. Okay, so the, what, the story you just told, that transpired in 1984. Yeah, okay. So then the Commodore LCD with the, uh, with the, with the modular phone port in the side, right. what year was that? 85. 85. So they're back as Atari by now. Okay. But I'm over on the I need to show you this. Later. Okay. Any other questions? Later. What is your opinion of these Brian Bagnall books here? I haven't read them. Oh, you haven't? He I'm signed sorry. some, but he hasn't read them. <laughs> I, I have not read them. I was wondering if they are accurate or not. Um, nothing is accurate. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I've actually spent um, about a decade um, bashing my head against the California Department of Education, okay. trying to convince them of a really silly idea, which is that textbooks need to be accurate. Um, yeah. and, and failing, and failing miserably. Um, if textbooks aren't accurate, there's no way those are. Um, I did talk to Brian a couple of times, um, so hopefully, what is in there? I think there's a quote from me on the back, um, which I didn't know until I saw a picture somewhere. Um, so hopefully, the questions he asked me, I answered correctly and he transcribed what I said correctly, but I, I don't know. And, and Leonard's corrected some of the things I missed what Connor said, just completely wrong, so as he said, you're not right. Since they mentioned the book, uh, and it, he seems to think that your father was obsessed with keeping the Japanese out of the American market, would you say that was accurate? No, that, was, that is not accurate. He was obsessed with not having successful competition. He didn't care whether it was the Japanese or anybody else. I believe he understood that he needed Japan and Germany to be the what he was. And other people weren't in Japan. And here we have an office full of speaking Japanese-speaking people. That was our angle and our edge, you know, for mass production. One of the examples he gives is uh, your father had a chance to lock in the license, license to be right for Donkey Kong early in '41 out in the United States. 
And at the last second, he bailed. Can't imagine how that's true. At the last second, he bailed out of the deal because he was afraid that would give him a can't, can't imagine how that's true. Donkey Kong was There's on one the one. Atari. Yes, that was <coughs> even before that. He was in the first one, according to the book. Nah. I, my understanding is that you, your dad wasn't obsessed with it. Didn't, the games wasn't the 64 for him. It was yeah. educational and the stuff you could do with it. That's, right. that's what drove his yeah. interest in the 64. So I, I couldn't believe he'd have any... So it was computing, it was, you know, the, the whole power for the masses, not the classes yeah. thing. Yeah. So you, you've probably heard that before. Yeah. Any truth to the fact that you were not big enough back? Commodore had the opportunity to purchase Apple or Leo? No. None whatsoever. Oh, I thought that was in the anniversary. He, he talked about his talks with Steve Jobs. Yeah, so... Um, Steve won in 45, and you, you, in, uh, Jack Tremiel said on stage something about an offer of 10000 and it kind of no, so the, funny from there on. There, the, uh, the, what, what happened, and you can go back and... That, that talk is on the web, mm -hmm. so you can listen yep, to yep. it. Um, I, it was an hour long, I don't remember everything he said. But basically, at, at one point, while the pet was being designed, um, Jobs, and I don't remember if Waz was there or not, came in to talk to Commodore about marketing the Apple computer. Mm -hmm. And um, Dad said, We're, we've got our own. Uh, we're going to make one as well, uh, but if you're using our processor, here are some samples. But good luck. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Japan, when in the news recently, because of Tony Bob of Nintendo, who recently passed away, used to start a few games for it. What happened to Commodore Japan? I have no idea. So when when we left Commodore in um, January of 84 um, and dove pretty quickly into Atari. Uh, my direct association with Commodore was non-existent. So Bill will know a lot more about it than I, uh, but uh, no idea. And, and it gets I assume they did good engineering because they always did. And there's a movie out called uh, uh, by Dave Haney called uh, Deathbed Virgil. Vigil. I, I won't even watch it because it's too sad. You know. So the life after me, I, I did the same thing. It's like I, I don't need to hear about this coming apart. You know, because this had been Camelot when I've been there. Yeah, what, watching Commodore slowly sort of shrivel up and yes. die was, was yes. uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, for either of you, or whatever, um, it's kind of fantasy conjecture of how the products and the industry would have gone if, you know, companies like Commodore and Atari were still around or didn't all go to where the, the PC went initially, you know, hardware-wise, computer culture wise um, Do you guys have any idealizations from back there of how you would have loved to grow from a product and user perspective? Or just, you know, things happen the way they do and modular the easiest and that sort of I Speculation is hard to make, especially about the future, as Yogi Berra said. Um, I, who knows? Try to predict what happened, what would have happened under different. Yeah, about that's you know, a dream scenario. Something would love to see. Well, so you got uh, to try it at Atari, just different company, right? Yeah, I mean, we we try to do again at Atari what Commodore did. Um, the ST was an attempt to make a low-priced high-powered computer um, with the characteristics that seem to be the direction of the future. So a whole mouse-based graphical interface yeah, thing. Um, so I, I, I keep kicking myself that I didn't insist on this more. Um, but I had an idea that we should have done a TV commercial where someone was using a mouse to draw an Apple logo. In, which at the time was in color. And the only machine with a graphical user interface that could have drawn that logo was an ST. And I couldn't decide whether we were gonna have the people at Apple doing that, but they could use their own machine or, or what, but it never went anywhere. Um, so the, the ST family of computers is actually quite successful in Europe. 
and we said that the reason for that was the phrase no one was ever fired for buying IBM yeah. had never been translated into German. <laughs> um, but the, when, so back in the mid 70s, were too old when you say things like that? Yeah. Um, so back in the mid 70s, um, I remember you know, standing around talking to people in the, in the computer industry, talking about what, what people would use these things for. And of course, the reason anyone would buy a pet seen one of those before. Um, wrong font. Excuse me? That's the wrong font. I can't tell from <laughs> No, on, on, on the word computer? No, no. <laughs> Please. I knew you were sensitive. My, my eyesight's not that bad. So, um, the only reason anyone would buy one of these, or the primary reason, would be to learn to program. Because as we know, that's what everyone wants to do with computers. Uh, that turned out to be incorrect. Uh, every, every pundit in the computer industry got that wrong um, almost every time. Uh, you know, what people would wind up using computers for. The only person that ever made a prediction that came close to true was actually Nolan Bushnell. Um, I was talking to him in the, would have been about 87, and he said, People are going to use computers on networks for social things, and it, to, in order to make that happen, we have to get women involved. He said girls. <laughs> um, and you, you need to make it friendly enough that you can use it, and people are just going to do social stuff. He didn't say it would be you know, social networking because the term didn't exist yet. Um, but that, that was the closest thing to a correct prediction ever made. Yeah. Um, the Italian company that owns the rights to the Commodore name now is releasing a phone called the Commodore Pad. I saw that. It's going to have a built-in 64 emulator and uh, Amiga emulator. Are you glad that, that even though you're not connected to it, that the brand name is living on? And They're the using the wrong damn font. <laughs> but I, saw, I saw the picture and it's, it's, the, it's the wrong damn font. But um, but a whole another generation, you know, will, will, will it be exposed to some aspect? I, I, I hope so. The company like, is a scam. <laughs> this is the right font. They find for a registered right font. That's the right font. They did not license the copyright, in which way they would have had to license from us. And we asked them, did you license the Commodore logo from the successors of Turkey? And they never replied. So they never passed the due diligence. I asked, my colleague asked, and Trevor Dickens asked, and they never replied. So we never went to the step of licensing their own required information. And what they say, well, anybody can register one com uh, company in the UK and call it Commodore, right? Or you can call it Amiga, you can call it whatever, from this company, and it doesn't make it a real one. So we are waiting to see what will happen. Sorry, yeah, I, I have no idea gone. what the legalities there are. I am sure they're complicated. Yeah. Two, two real quick questions. Is it Tramiel or Trammel? Tramel. Tramel. Okay. Yeah. Rhymes with Dudwell. Gotcha. <laughs> have you thought about writing a book yourself? You're, you're, I admire you and your family, and, and your dad's been maligned a couple times by other people. It's really? A couple uh, times. Oh. And be, <laughs> by people, that, were, by people be, that weren't even alive back then. Right, right, right. It'd be, it'd be yeah. real. Uh, I get to look up to you and what, what he did, and being in the Holocaust and all that. Um, to a lot of the, the, the Holocaust related stuff is mm -hmm. documented in, in a couple of places. Mm -hmm. um, and that was incredibly important to him. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the rest of the story, I, he didn't think it was important. He, he, he just he did not think it was important at all. Now, Leonard, I'll tell you that with, when, my, when your father passed away, I sat my son down. And I told him about your dad's life, and kind of what, what it was was, look what this man did. And I told my son he can do anything, too. And when your dad says, I set out to make a company to do this, and I succeeded, that's the one person, the one statement I've heard where it's just, it's not ego, it's not, it's just a simple statement of true fact as to what he did for the industry. Yep, took, took a lot of work, a lot of perseverance, yep. an incredible amount of skill, um, and to an extent that he probably would never acknowledge an awful lot of luck. Um, but.
so um, I got I, I got another convention to get to. <laughs> uh, but anything else? Leonard and Bill, before you separate or go your uh, separate ways, we have cake. We have 30th anniversary cake here that we well, that's can serve. Obviously for Bill. You have to you have to cut it. You have to cut it and have a piece of it. So it's right there. This layer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Woo! Yeah!
Oh, man. On the other side of the screen, it all looks so easy. End of line.